All right, so chapter two for advanced biology is going to get into some basic chemistry. And a basic definition that you need to know is what matter is. And we know that matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. You also know that it comes in three states, solid, liquid, and gases. Um, all matter, whether it's living or non-living, are made up of elements. And we talked about this last year in chemistry. And elements are substances that cannot be broken down to simpler substances with different properties. There are 92 naturally occurring elements, and these are the building blocks of matter. Other elements have been human-made. We don't really consider those biologically important because they don't make us up. Elements that make up 95% of living organisms by weight, these are important for you to know. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And you need to memorize these in this order, schnapps, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur make up 95% of living organisms by weight. Atomic structure, quick review. We know that the atom is the smallest part of an element that has the same properties of that element, and atoms are made up of smaller particles, such as protons, which are positively charged and found in the nucleus. Neutrons are not charged, and they're also found in the nucleus, and the electrons that are negatively charged and they move around the nucleus. So here's a chart that just shows us subatomic particles. Remember that um, the atomic masses are different. Protons and neutrons are about the same in atomic mass, so we say that they're one atomic mass unit. Electrons, it takes almost 2,000 to equal the mass of one proton or neutron, so we consider that negligible. Okay, the atomic mass is the number of protons and neutrons. The atomic number is the number of protons in the nucleus. Remember that this atomic number is the personality of the atom. This tells us what atom or what element, I'm sorry, what element we're talking about. In this case, uh, we're looking at carbon, which has the atomic number of six. Also in the periodic table, the rows from left to right are periods, and top to bottom are the groups. Isotopes, by definition, they have um, the same atom with the same element, the only difference are the number of neutrons. And if you look at this one, for example, we look at carbon, and carbon, here's its identity, the number of protons, which is six, which is what makes it carbon. But if you notice here, the uh, number at the top, the mass number is different. That's because the number of protons are the same, but the number of neutrons are different. So this one is carbon 12 with six neutrons. This is carbon 13 with seven and carbon-14 with eight neutrons in the nucleus. And it, generally, they have the same, um, the same reactivity, but uh, sometimes it causes a little shift in things. You'll notice that carbon-14 actually is radioactive. All right, so what do we use radiation for? We use low levels of radiation for things such as a thyroid scan that I'm going to show you a picture of next. Um, and this has a scan that indicates a tumor because it doesn't take up the radioactive iodine that was absorbed by the tissue around it. And a PET scan, which is a pos positron emission tomography scan. And um, this shows a portion of the brain that's active. And the active parts are the yellow and the red colors. And you can see that here is the yellow the red portions of this brain scan, this PET scan. And here you see the tumors because they didn't absorb the radioactive iodine. We also use high levels of radiation. And an example of that would be this, um, the peaches that are up here. You notice that the top peaches look pretty decayed. The bottom peaches look nice and, and uh, fresh off the shelf. They have been irradiated with um, radiation that's killed off the bacteria, and that slows down the uh, process of uh, spoilage, and up here this wasn't, and you notice how they're spoiling. So it helps us preserve food, and also we use physicians, we'll use radiation to um, uh, kill cancer cells, and those are high doses of radiation as opposed to low. Let's take a look at electrons. Remember that an electron um, is what reacts in a chemical reaction. An electrically neutral atom, the positive charges of the nucleus, the protons in the nucleus, are balanced by the negative charges outside of the nucleus. And we know, and we learned last year in, in Chem 1, that we know the energy levels are not in orbitals, um, or in concentric circles, but in orbitals that are probability clouds. 
And the first orbital is going to contain two electrons, and everyone after that is going to contain eight because uh, we find that the elements are, atoms are much more comfortable with eight in their outer shell. This is an example of what, how you would write the hydrogen atom. The nucleus would have one proton and would have one electron on the outside edge. Carbon, on the other hand, uh, protons would be six protons, six neutrons in the center, six electrons on the outside. You notice that we have two in the first shell and four in the next shell, a maximum of eight in the outer shell, but only two in the inner shell. Nitrogen, we have two and then five in the outer shell. Oxygen, two and then six in the outer shell. Phosphorus has two. Then we have eight in uh, the next orbital. And after that, the extras go in the next one out. The, the last five go in the last orbital out or shell out. Sulfur is the same way. We have two, then eight, then six on the outside and the outside orbital. All right, molecules and compounds. Molecules are when you have two or more atoms bonded together, such as oxygen, and they're the same type. Compounds form when you have two or more different elements bonded together, like as in water. And you remember that when a chemical reaction occurs, it's either going to give off energy or it's going to absorb energy. So we either have exothermic or endothermic reactions. Ionic bonding is when we have ions that are formed, and this happens because there's been a transfer of electrons from one atom to another producing ions, and that attraction holds them together. Um, here's an example that's a classic example of sodium and chlorine. Notice that sodium has, um, in its outer orbital, has one electron, and if it could lose that electron, it would end up with eight in its outer shell and be stable. Chlorine has seven in its outer shell, and if it were to gain an electron, it would have eight in its um, outermost orbital, and it would be uh, comfortable and reach the octet rule. When that happens, we have uh, a transfer of that one electron. Sodium, because it lost an electron, becomes a positive one. Chlorine, because it lost or gained an electron, becomes a negative one charge. And that uh, charge is what holds that ionic compound together. Covalent bonding is sharing. So a covalent bond is going to happen when two atoms share electrons to uh, meet the octet rule. Here's an example of hydrogen gas. They each have one, but if they share those, uh, the one that they have, they can each have two in their outer shell, make them comfortable. You can have double bonds. If you notice, oxygen here shares uh, four electrons between the two of them instead of just two, forming a covalent double bond. We can look at the shape of covalent molecules, and if you look at methane, you'll notice that it's got uh, electrons that it shares with hydrogen on the out, outer uh, orbital and causing it to take this structure. We're going to look more at the structure and shape. If we were to look at that in a ball and stick model, which we used last year, it's a tetrahedral structure with 109 degree bond angles between them. So this is our ball and stick model of methane. We can also look at a space filling model uh, where you would see space where we would expect to see electrons and show them bonded together in that manner as well. We're going to look at nonpolar covalent bonds. That's when the sharing between these bonds is fairly equal. And we noticed that with hydrogen, they have equal pull. The electronegative values are about the same. Uh, the, the pull here with the carbon and the hydrogen is equal distant pulling. So that's going to be pretty well nonpolar covalent. But you look at water, for example, and we see polar covalent bonds. And that has to do with the fact that oxygen is much more electronegative than the hydrogens are. So what happens to it is it has an affinity for that electron that's being shared, so it keeps it in its orbital more of the time, causing it to be a little bit negative and the hydrogens to be slightly positive, like it shows on the space filling model here. It also causes, uh, because there's, no, there's unpaired electrons, and we, if we had the sticks, you would see the sticks coming off the oxygen, but would there be no hydrogens at the end? So what we actually see in the ball and stick model is the V or the bent shape. And that um, bonding that happens due to this in, unequal sharing is going to cause hydrogen bonding between water molecules. And that's just because we have slightly positive hydrogens, slightly negative oxygens. And if you look at the other 
water molecules, they're in the same boat, they have the same uh, unequal sharing of electrons, and they position themselves to, and to be attracted to the next slightly negative and slightly positive edges of the molecule next to them, which leads to a lot of water's uh, properties that we're going to talk about in the next lecture.